And um, also, I want to thank the staff of the library. They did an amazing job packing up the old library and getting us set up here. Um, it just was a phenomenal job. They did, you know, they really mention um, our dear, um, can anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll move back there in a minute. Uh, uh, here she comes, <laughs> Ann Roach. Um, um, I also wanted to uh, just keep in your thoughts our dear town historian, Michelle Figlomania, who um, had a fall recently and is recovering, she's fine. Um, but she did uh, donate this room to the library, so uh, you know, keep your thoughts and prayers uh, for her. Thank you. Um, like I said, this is a continuation of a talk I gave uh, two years ago, but today we're going to focus on um, pharmacies and um, grocery stores. And as soon as I get my notes. <laughs> Is that okay for everyone? Yeah. Well, I don't want it too good. How does that look? That's good. We'll get used to it. Um, so get your pens out, because I'm going to start out with some statistics, um, just to give you an idea. And um, can everybody hear me before we start? Okay, great. Um, in 1874 and 1875, there were four drug stores and eight grocery stores. In 1878, with a population of 3,903, there were 143 farmers, which is quite amazing, two billiard parlors, four shoe stores, four cigar makers, four clothing stores, four confectioners, which is uh, soda fountains and ice cream stores, um, three drug stores, four dry goods stores, 11 grocery stores, eight of which were on West Main and three were on Greenwich. Which is going to be, um, I didn't expect to have this video set up right this. And um, by 1897, we had four bakeries, five barbers, five confectionery and fruit stores, nine grocery stores, four druggists, 12 hotels, five um, uh, butchers, six doctors, and 16 wine and liquor establishments, <laughs> which included, um, includes restaurants and liquor stores. And in 1939, Goshen had 72 stores, four drug stores, with a combination of 50,000 sales. Of the drug in the drug stores, and um, then by 1945 there were still 13 grocery stores, five on Main and six on Greenwich, one on Market Street and one on South Church, with three drug stores. And um, in the 1919, and uh, there was two places which I thought was interesting, a place called the Good Luck Buttering Store, which was at 55 West Main Street which I'm not sure what the number is today. I didn't really check that out. And another place called the Globe Store, which is, was way up on West Main at 164 West Main. So we have to do some more research and find out what those two businesses actually were. Okay, so let's get moving here. And um, the, just to give you, a, 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 I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar, but we'll go back and give you some basic history. and. Uh, Actually, oops. This is, um, I don't know how many of you have noticed this. This is a, our new historic marker on the square, which we got last fall, um, uh, acknowledging the Church Park Historic District that was created in 1980. Um, I've applied for three more markers this year. Um, one for the Village Hall. Uh, there is a marker there, which is wood, which has probably been there since 1976 when it became the Village Hall, and it's kind of deteriorating. Uh, the second marker was for the Erie train station where uh, Robert Burdell, who was um, president of the Erie Railroad, uh, shot his brother-in-law, Wisner Murray, and um, 
Yeah, and the third marker is Burdell <laughs> uh, uh, owned the Interpines. Uh, he, he built the house on the Interpines there. Um, and the third marker is for General Grant, who spent um, a short visit at the Smith House, the Hiram Smith House. Um, and the, the signs now are given by the Pomeroy Foundation out of Syracuse, New York. Uh, they used to be given by the New York State, but now the Pomeroy Foundation is it's taken over and it's distributing the signs and awarding them. And I got a call from the Pomeroy Foundation and they are, each, out of the three markers, they're interested in this one, simply because uh, Ulysses S. Grant stopped here. Um, his general, General uh, John Rawlins, was um, married to a Goshen girl, Mary Smith, who, whose family lived in this house. And uh, after General Rawlins died, Mary Smith died very young, at like 28 years old. And uh, after the war and uh, General Rawlins died, uh, Ulysses says Grant became ward of the children of John Rawlins. And he came to Goshen and he stayed at the Backman Estate off of Stony Ford Road. And on his way out of town, he stopped here to visit the, the General Rawlins' children. Um, there was a marker, you can see it on the, um, my pointer here. You can see it on the house here, right there. Um, what was interesting is um, the date was wrong on the marker. <laughs> um, it says he visited the house on the 24th of September when it was actually the 25th of September on his way out of town. And um, the signs, it, the, that marker deals with him. Uh, it says he came to visit the horses at the track, which is um, the Pomeroy Foundation is more interested in actual purpose of stopping at the house, which was to visit the children. So I think the new marker is going to reflect that, and, and the date will be changed. There's a new owner of this building. I don't know if he's here today. Um, and he's going to paint it and uh, put a new roof on it. And so it's, it is being taken care of. Now, to, to, for those who don't know, we're going to, um, oops, wrong way. This um, is Lawyer's Row which everyone's familiar with. Um, this was the original business district of the village. And um, what's interesting, and people are always asking me this about photos, there's not, I, in my 30 something years of collecting photos, and, and uh, I've never seen an old photo of Lawyer's Row. The earliest one I've seen is probably uh, taken by Elizabeth Sharts, who was the, uh, the historian. And, uh, and that photo is probably from the late 40s, the early 1950s. Um, so if you ever come across a photo of Lawyer's Row that from you know, the 19th century, uh, don't throw it out. Um, and this is from the other angle. Uh, in, uh, there were two fires along here in 1841 and in 1843. And, um, oops, let's see here. It goes. Let me do it this way. This was, um, you have a guest at the door there. Um, the house on the left probably predates the fire of uh, 1841 and 43. Uh, this house obviously was built in 1878. There was a, a, a supposedly a, a two-story stone a brick house next to it that was owned by uh, Samuel. Excuse me, get my notes here. Um, Samuel Kitchell, uh, Major Sam, Samuel Kitchell, and his wife, and he was a cobbler. And uh, also in the building was Justice Hoyt's office, and Justice Hoyt was the town clerk. So with, during the fire, all the, the town records were destroyed, which is why there's a very big gap in our history of Goshen. Um, and it, it, supposedly the fire started it in uh, Mr. Kitchell's uh, cobbler shop. And later, um, oops. This is Kate Schartz. Uh, Kate Schartz was a Goshen lady. She was uh, born in 1864 along Main Street, and she died in uh, 1939. She was known as the mother of historic track, and she ran a boarding house. Oops, sorry here. 
in these two buildings. Supposedly these buildings were connected and there was a restaurant in the basement known as the Subway. And um, she knew everyone who was involved in harness racing stayed there and ate there. And um, her, her daughter, uh, Elizabeth Schartz, uh, became the first official town and village historian of Goshen. Um, also along this area, Oops, sorry, I'm getting used to this here. Down. Down? Okay, there we go. I'm getting confused by the little one here. Um, this is an illustration of, of uh, Main Street. And you can see this is uh, not a great rendering of the Hall of Fame and the uh, Trotting Horse Museum. But it shows the three houses that were next to it that were destroyed, and supposedly there was other houses here. This is Griffith Realty right here, and nothing has really changed along here. This is pretty much the same as it is today. That's the Main Street School, the 1841 court, uh, the old library, excuse me, um, and uh, this is the 1841 courthouse with the county jail behind it. Um, and along here were uh, many businesses. There was a bakery. Um, the first um, actual that I could find at this point, a documented pharmacy was here, run by uh, Dr. David Arnell and James Heron. And they had a business here before 1820, but by 1826, Dr. Arnell, Dr. Arnell had died, and they went out of business, and Horace Elliott opened a pharmacy, and his house was on the site of the, um, Goshen, the old Goshen Library. Originally, Hill Street wasn't straight like it is today. There, there were uh, houses here, and there was a house attached to the orange inn, the limoncellos, that were removed to straighten the street. Um, but anyway, uh, Horace had a business there, and um, in 1840, he moved down, 1840, 1841, he moved down uh, to West Main Street. And then in September 23rd, 1841, everything changed. Anybody know why? The railroad. the railroad, exactly. Everything changed in Goshen. Everything moved from along this business area of Main Street down to uh, where the Erie Station, the police station is today. Um, <coughs> one of the things doing this research, it's, it was like putting a, a jigsaw puzzle together because especially back in the uh, late 1800s, the buildings didn't have numbers, and then the numbers at least along West Main Street have changed, I think, at least three times. I think uh, uh, where we're going to see a couple of pharmacies, the numbers don't reflect anything that they were uh, back in the, the, even the early 20th century. So it made figuring out what was where quite difficult. I think I'm supposed to go this way. And one of the reasons um, that instituted this talk was our dear Baxter's Pharmacy that closed recently. And uh, this has been the site of a pharmacy since 1924. And uh, so it made it as a pharmacy from 1924 to 2019. That's a pretty good run. Uh, and here it is as Strong's Pharmacy. Harold Strong was a, a pharmacist. He started up further up Main Street, which we'll get to in a minute, in 1924, and he moved to this location in uh, 1952. And you can see the menacing firehouse in the background here. Oops, wrong button here. Right there. Some kind of date. Uh, I never real. I'm not really sure the year, the actual year of this photograph. But. And that's the interior of Strong, with the soda fountain which I'm sure many people spent. The candy area was right here, and the cigarettes were over here. <laughs> and what's interesting, I don't remember in my day and age these low counters in here, but uh, when I was a kid, they were, there were card racks here. Question, Ed? Ed? Yes. Uh, when I, I, grew, I was born in 33, and that was an A and P at yes. yep. that time. Yep. Okay. And it wasn't your pharmacy the whole way through. 
was a pharmacy. No, Harold Strong was a pharmacist from right. 1924. I'm sorry if I didn't know. Right, he was up the road. He was yeah. up the street, which we're going to get to. That's correct, John. And here we're going to actually look at what the building was before it was a pharmacy. Um, how many people are, are, is there anyone here who's not from Goshen? Oh, quite a few. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. And uh, how many how many are new to Goshen? What's your definition of new? Well, within the last five years or so, <laughs> ten years, you know. Okay, all right. If I'm not clear on something, just ask, please, because uh, I don't want to assume people just know things. Okay. Um, this is the view of, this is the, the uh, Baxter Building. We'll call it the Baxter Building right now. Uh, right here, still standing. The Independent Republican was upstairs, and then downstairs was Hulse's Jewelry Store, which later became Sweezy's Jewelry Store. And in the basement was a restaurant, uh, a long-running restaurant, an oyster bar, clam bar, and at one time it was known as the Parisian Restaurant, which made it really exotic. <laughs> This, this in the background is the Occidental Hotel, which is that vacant lot you see next to the post office. Uh, and then this is a rare, this was a uh, gate tower for the Erie Railroad when they had to put these, uh, the gates down when the train was coming through. Uh, so they were, they were put down manually. And then this is, this is the area up here where the, where the pharmacists were. And over here you can see, this is a, this was Power and Company here on the left, which was in the High Withers building. And then up here were the um, Horton Decker Pharmacy. And right next door was the Dykeman Pharmacy, which was really interesting how they had two pharmacies right next door to each other. But they survived. And this is the Erie Station back here, which was is today our police station. And this is uh, three guys standing on West Main Street. Um, this is the blizzard of 88, it was uh, March 11th to 14th in 1988, and you can see quite a bit of snow they had. They didn't plow the snow in those days, they had uh, horse and uh, sleds ride up and down the streets and pack the snow down. Obviously they didn't get through here yet. Um, and what's, what's very interesting, and I, I keep saying, I have a number of snow photos, no one ever looks like they're dressed warm enough for the situation. <laughs> and everybody had a hat on. The hat, the hat business was uh, a great business to go to go into in the 1800s. Uh, this is the Baxter Building. This is the Bank of Orange County, which started in Maplewood um, by the Whipham family. And uh, in 1852, they built this building and moved out of um, Maplewood and uh, and this building has also gone through, a num uh, the bank building has gone through a number of changes over the years. Um, and this is, was the Goshen Hardware building, which is now uh, vacant at the moment, with a balcony in front of it. This is also the blizzard of 88. This is a, a, one of the iconic photos of Goshen, and one of my favorites, the, the kid sitting on the fire hydrant. and. Uh, and what's interesting is they had, plant, they had shoveled the sidewalk, but all the snow's still in the street. And this is, um, this is, this was a Holtz jewelry store right here. And this was Howell's over here before the building was built. This is a wood structure, um, which was uh, replaced by the present building. Presbyterian Church in the background. I must have hit a wrong button, sorry folks. Okay, this is, um, St. Omar Hotel here on the right, which was there from about 1883, and it burnt down in 1920 in February. This is the Erie Station from uh, 1863, I believe. And up here you can see H.A. Horton and Company Druggists. And this is where uh, Elsie's is today. It was a barber shop on the corner. It was divided into two, two stores. And um, Horton was in the, the attached building. I think Bliss um, clothing store is there now, if anybody's familiar with that. We'll get closer as we move on. And then same scene, and when Arthur Decker owned the pharmacy, and his name is up there on top of the building. And he was, he was after um, 
Mr. Horton. This is the building today. Now, this was this building where the Chinese food restaurant used to be Green Hills. This is was the Decker Pharmacy. Next door here, this is where um, this right here. I believe this was two stores. This was. Um, it was divided with uh, uh, Tuthill Plumbing on the right side, and um, Mr. Horton, which later became uh, Decker's Pharmacy, was on the left here. And then upstairs here was, in 1908, was the first Goshen Hospital. Uh, the it was known as the Goshen Emergency Hospital, which was uh, instituted by uh, Susan Randall Bacon, uh, who lived next to Maplewood and also on Hill Street. Uh, she was married to Henry Bacon, Bacon, who was a congressman, and her father, uh, Mr. Randall, was Speaker of the House of Representatives in Washington. And she came and lived in Goshen. And she was instrumental in, she was a civic worker all her life. Uh, her house burnt next to Maplewood, and she moved to the White House behind the old library on Hill Street, and she was there for years. And now everybody, I, I included this for a reason. Everyone romanticizes that the past always looked, everything was always wonderful in the past. Everything looked better, uh, you know, it wasn't true. Uh, I hate to say this, but downtown Goshen in the 1960s was not like it looked today. Um, and you can see this was the, it was the short line uh, bus terminal. And the short line bus terminal moved all over the village. It was across the street uh, in, um, in, um, next to where the bagel store is now across the street. And, um, and I, just, I just included this just to show you things weren't always so rough. <laughs> now this building is, this is where um, Maureen Mullaney's, one of our um, drinking establishments is located today. Uh, this was run by Louise Cox and her husband. Louise ran the store, and uh, her husband had like a lawn maintenance, uh, lawnmower maintenance business in the back. And uh, before this, it was owned by, and let me get the guy's name, because I did not. Um, let's see, I'm moving along here. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to. By Nathan, uh, Nathaniel Jennings owned a general store here, and that was built. Um, he was from Florida, New York. And the Coxes were there for all of my childhood in the 50s, anyway, in the early 60s. I'm not sure when they went out of business. Um, we didn't really research that. And. Um, This is a view of uh, West Main Street looking towards the square. And this was, um, the that might even be Mr. Jennings standing there. And these were the, this was the uh, Dykeman Drug Store, and down here was the uh, Horton Decker Drug Store Pharmacy. Um, what's interesting is there's no pictures of these. I've never seen a picture of these from face on. This is the only actual picture I've ever seen that uh, shows them. And then down here, you can see the, the railroad uh, tower. And way up in the background, you can see the Orange Blossoms Monument. So the Orange Blossoms Monument was ins installed in 1911. So we know this photo. Um, actually, that's not true. It's uh, earlier than that, 1909, I think. Anyway, early 1900s. And so. Uh, you can see there's no, there, all the, the transportation was all still horse and buggy. Um, and then this was Samuel's Clothing Store, um, which became uh, Powers, uh, Powers Pharmacy was in here, in this building, which is now High Withers. And then this is a, um, a train leaving the Erie Station and it's included because here is the Powers, Philip Powers sign and with Charlie Scott above it. And Charles Scott spent his whole career working for Philip Powers. 
Well, Philip Powers, let me give you some dates here because you might know more like dates. Uh, Philip Powers, Scott was born in, uh, Charlie Scott was born in 1869 in Goshen. Philip Powers uh, died August 3rd in 1911. Well, Charles took over the business, but Charles died in November. So he didn't own the business for that long. But the first thing he did was put up a sign with his name on it. <laughs> and, uh, he had, Charles Scott had worked there since he had been 14 years old. And uh, he worked there until his death in November of 1911. And there is, this guy on the left is Philip Power, and this is Charlie Scott. And he lived on Murray Avenue. I'm not sure where Mr. Powers lived. And this was the pharmacy. And this is, this is the High Withers building on the left. There was two stores on the left was uh, the pharmacy, and on the right was the grocery store. And this is Mae Bassett, Mary Bassett, um, who I knew and lived across the street from me growing up, um, myself growing up. And this is, um, she, her mother was a Scot. Her mother, uh, so when Charles was dying, he basically told Mae to take over the business. And, and uh, she did have a pharmacist working for her, but in 1935, she went to NYU and got her degree in pharmacy. And I'm sure she was probably the only woman at the school at the time. And she came back and um, worked here until January 13, 1955. And she lived on Murray Avenue with her sister Jenny, who lived across the street from me when I was a kid. I used to do odd jobs for them. Um, and. Uh, they were quite interesting women of their time. Um, the house was filled with antiques, and I remember Jenny saying to me, she said, oh, Ed, she said, everyone thinks we have so many antiques. She says, it's just that everything's so damn old. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she had, um, there was an auction after she passed in, uh, on the lawn with a big tent. And I remember her telling me that she had two things in the house. One was, a tea set that was given to her by Mr. Mrs. Westinghouse, who lived on the old Chester Road, and it was delivered to her by the Westinghouse chauffeur. And the other thing she had was a, um, a uh, cherry cabinet, and I believe the tea set was in the cabinet. Well, at the auction, I think the tea set went for $30,000, and we're talking back in the 1970s. And I think the cabinet went for like twelve or sixteen thousand dollars. So Jenny knew what she had in the house, even though she really didn't want to admit it or kind of let on to anybody, you know, what she had. So. And then this, you can see, um, this is Wanger's building. This is all High Withers now, the whole building. So you can see how uh, the pharmacy was next door, and uh, this was uh, Ted Wanger's grocery store. Now, um, Wanger started out on John Street, which is over here, which is now Walker Street, at 35 John Street. Edward <coughs> Wanger, Ted, Ted Wanger's father, was a butcher, and he had a butcher shop here, which is what got Ted Wanger, who we, most of us know, uh, started in the grocery business, and then he moved across the street here. This is actually all, one of the only shots I have of, of John Street is what it looked like. This was uh, Shisa's clothing store. Uh, and I assume, I'm not really sure which was 35. I'm assuming this was might have been the butcher shop because I think it was pretty residential down here. Down in the end was um, Rumbasack's liquor store and uh, Zex, I think it was Zex's liquor store. And this was, this was Greenberg's here on the corner, United Cigar Store, which we'll get into in a minute, um, which later became uh, Rosens and Markers. That the, all these are still there except for these houses uh, on the back. This is the corner of the Farmer's Hotel on Greenwich Avenue in the background. And someone we were talking before, this was Franklin's TV. This was, um, this was known as the Erie Hotel. And there were, when, they, when they said there were 12 hotels in, in the village, most of them were this size. Um, the only real hotels were the Orange Inn, what we consider large hotels, uh, the St. Elmo, 
um, the Occidental. Most of them were smaller buildings like this with probably you know, five to 10 rooms at the most. And here's a, this is an ad for Wangers. Uh, we'll have this advertisement throng throughout the thing. Um, the this shop in the store that grew up in Goshen. So that's, um, his father actually started in off in Goshen. And you call uh, Goshen 166 for service and quality. For, from, and everything from giblets to jellies. <laughs> And sausage, that's right. And then this is Bill's Deli, which I think was short-lived uh, after Ted went out of business. Um, I don't remember much about this. They did change the facade of the building a bit. But this goes back to, the, as I was talking about in the 60s and what Goshen actually looked like. Now this is, this is Max Susswein's pharmacy. It started out, um, let's see, I have a date for that. Um, well, Max Susswein was here for 35 years. Before, it, before that, um, he was, uh, it was a cut rate pharmacy. Um, and then Max came to Goshen and turned it into the Goshen Pharmacy. I, I want to go back uh, before we get a little too far and um, while we're still on the um, on the pharmacy subject. I want to talk about Edward Dykeman because I, I missed some notes here that um, I, I meant to mention. Um, as I said, Horace Elliott sort of got Edward Dykeman um, in the business. And Edwin Dykeman opened his store, his pharmacy in 1855. He was born in Warwick in 1828 and he died in 18, 1895 and he's buried in Warwick. Um, he came to Goshen in 1850 as a harness maker and then studied under uh, Horace Elliott. And um, now he either, depending on which history you read or where you're, they, Elliott was either in the Powers building or he was already up in the Dykeman building um, further up West Main Street. It's not very clear from, uh, from the research I've done exactly where uh, Mr. Elliot first opened. Um, I don't know if anybody was around in uh, 1850. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, John, do you, John, do you remember Edwin Dykeman? <laughs> Vaguely. I, yeah, I kind of figured that. Um, but Edwin, Edwin Dykeman was the true uh, civic yeah. leader in Goshen. He was trustee for 12 years. He served as president, which later became the office of mayor, from 1868 to 1872, and then again from 1874 to 1875. And um, he spent 16 years on the Board of Education, and he, um, he helped organize the, what became the Dykeman Fire Company in 1873, and they ended up naming the Dykeman Fire Company after him. His son, um, Edwin Dykeman Jr. took over the business in 1895 and ran it till 1924 when Harold Strong took over in that building. And then in 1952, uh, Harold moved down the street to the Baxter building. And then this is a this is a uh, a scene. This was taken in the early 70s. This photo, um, a scene that's recently changed. This is now Fetch. This was the Wonder Bar, one of the many drinking establishments. Howell's, Howell's Luncheonette was over here. And this is a shot of the Goshen Pharmacy here on the corner, which is now uh, Kraft 40-something, uh, whatever the number is. And this just went up on the square. I don't know if everyone's seen this yet, but we're getting a new pharmacy, so the story continues. Uh, Cure Pharmacy, this is where um, the Legoland office was. It's going to be a pharmacy. I don't know if they've come to the planning board yet, have they? They have? There you go. And um, to, uh, to move on to grocery stores, this is um, the corner of uh, West Main Street and uh, 
Walker Street, John Street. This place was known as the Lemon. It was owned by uh, it was Knapp's grocery store, but its nickname was the Lemon. And um, not a great photo, but it gives you an idea of, of the setup on the corner. And then this also, this was from a newspaper. This is um, The, um, this is the lemon on the corner. This was the Vienna Bakery, which later became the Holtz Bakery. And then there was a restaurant further down the street, which we'll see in a minute. This is, almost every grocery store had their own delivery wagon. And this is uh, Char Charlie Knapp, the owner. This is um, George Reamer, who was a clerk, and I think he worked for him for a long time. This is Henry Farrell, and this is uh, George Schartz, right here. And I think um, Henry, Fer I don't know if Henry Farrell ever worked there. He's, in all, all the pictures, he's, he's dressed up. So I have the feeling he uh, just hung out there a lot. Every time the cameraman came by, he was ready. Uh, yes, sir? Andy, you just said, what year was this? This was 1907. This was 1907. The, the, the automobile came into the photos in the, the mid to late teens, so like 1917, 1918. You'll start to see automobiles in the photographs. Before that, it was all horse and carriages. And there, there is um, Henry Farrell and his friend George Reamer in front of the store. And they obviously were having a special on cabbages. And uh, <laughs> this is further up the street, which is now... Um, it's a, I think it's a Chinese restaurant. It's, I don't know. I've never eaten there, I hate to say. Um, this is on West Main Street. There's a Chinese restaurant right there. The, the building next door was the Dayton building, the, the old Kitty Nook, if anybody remembers that. This, that was along here. This was the Markers building. I'll, I'll, there's a streetscape here coming up that'll, that'll explain it better. And I included this just to show you the streetscape in the back. This is William Jennings Bryant, who ran for president, Democrat, in 1896, 1900, and 1908. Uh, one of the interesting things about this, out of all this crowd, he's the only one without a hat on. <laughs> Maybe that's why he lost, I don't know. But anyway, here's the, here's the lemon over here. This is Knapp's grocery store. You can see the uh, horse and buggy in front of the place. This was the bakery, and this woman is standing in the doorway of the restaurant. This was Addison Porter's um, novelty store, which was a, 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 a um, basically it was a early five and ten cent store, and they lived on Orange Avenue. And then this building was owned by the Dayton family. It was a shoe store, and then later in life it became um, the Kitty Nook. It was a a, a, a um, store for young children, children's clothing. And then this was the Goshen Hardware building here. And here's another shot just to give you a perspective of, of one of the things, um, I, I don't know how to phrase it, uh, Goshen didn't do very well at, is um, the Church Park basically was a residential district. We've almost totally eliminated. There's only two houses left uh, on the Church Park. And one of the things we've done in Goshen is uh, eliminated, and it, it, it wasn't planned, but it, it, it occurred, is the walkability of the village, especially the downtown. Um, basically, all we have left is West Main Street and Upper up Main Street. But the business area is, um, as you can see, this was the St. Elmo. There were stores all along the St. Elmo. This was the Occidental in the background, and you can see um, it had wooden col uh, square columns, which were later replaced. And then these two buildings survived the fire of 1920. And then this, this, this was Samuel's clothing store. And what's interesting here, and I, I had to get the building inspector here, this balcony here, with, uh, you can see where the staircase came down, and there's no railing there. So if anybody came off the edge there, I'm sure they would. This was a bar over here on the right where the uh, Erie Hotel was right here. And then this was the lemon over here on the corner later Greenberg's in the bakery. There's another shot from the 60s, kind of give you an idea. 
this was uh, Greenberg's that later became Rosen's and then Marker's. Wanger's was here. And these, these um, are a remnant from the past. These flagstones were used when Goshen had um, dirt streets. And they would, lie, they would put these across the street so people didn't have to walk in the mud to cross the street. And these, I don't know if there's any left in the village at all. I can't recall any that are left. But that's what those were for. This is that, um, this was the restaurant where the woman was standing in the doorway in the previous picture. This is where that Chinese restaurant is. The building was really divided into three stores. Whoops. Yes, sir. You see the bus coming through there? Where was the bus stop? Hey, man, I'm losing my uh, directions here. <laughs> The bus stop. Um, the bus stop was in in um, in um, yeah. It was in Marcus for a while. It was, but it was also in um, Miller's had a um, restaurant in where the bakery place is now on the corner, and uh, they used to have a seating area in the front window. And you'd sit in the front window, and then when the bus came, you could see it pull up. It pulled up over here. Yeah, Mae Bassett also was a bus. Actually, on that picture, I think she has a, a short line sign in her window. This was um, this was Rundle's grocery store, and this was on Upper West Main Street. It's an Italian restaurant now. Um, I think it's Armani's. Armani's. Um, I'm not sure if this is Mrs. Rundle or not. Um, let me see if I have. Uh, it was run by Rose and Claude uh, Rundle. This building is part, it's still standing. It's a Mexican restaurant. Um, it was part of the Sayre Lumber Yard. And um, this was Simon's grocery store before it was run, run by A gas company? And this is an ad for Rundles. And the thing that caught me was, this was a mom and pop store, which most of these grocery stores were, in fact, all of them, um, open seven days a week, 7 a.m. to midnight. And it was two of them running this floor. So, does anybody remember Mr. Rundle? Yes. Besides my sister? <laughs> How does anybody remember that voice, that other Foy's. Does anybody remember Foy's? You remember Foy's grocery store along West Main Street? It was down by where the saddle shop was. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay, this was this is nineteen oh nine. This is the Sarah Lumberyard fire. And as you can see, this is the, the Rundle building. It was probably owned by Simon then, I would imagine. And um, there was a, um, so, uh, Sarah had a um, stone works here. And you can see that um, he sold gravestones. And that's what these are right here. There's a monument right there. And um, this today is Sarusky's parking lot. And I, was, I think the interesting, you can see the St. Elmo Hotel back here. This was the Van Vliet building here. This building is no longer there. There's another building right now. But this is this is Slate Hill in the back here. It's a Presbyterian church with no trees. And this is um, this is Catherine's, the restaurant right here. This was the Arlington, later the Union Hotel here on the corner. Now this is the St. Elmo. St. Elmo had 52 rooms. It was built in 1883 and owned by the Hawk family. And um, it was quite the uh, political and social center of the village um, until it burnt down in 1920. But uh, the whole, this is where the post office was. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, on the site of the post office, um, there was a plumbing place here, ice cream store. There was a, um, I believe this is a shoe store. Uh, this was the entrance to the hotel over here. And, uh, but it, it extended, like I was talking about before, the walking distance of the village. Sorry, it's all I'm having trouble with the connection. 
<laughs> and you can see that this was probably, um, well, it's definitely before 1920, but you can see that the automobile has t definitely taken over the horse and buggy. But people still, there are, I love these pictures where there's both on the street. After, after the St. Elmo burnt, the, when the post office was built, this, this street, uh, Canal Street was, um, I'm excuse me, Grand Street was widened um, to accommodate the, the post office. It sits much further back than this did. This was much closer to the railroad station. Was it, was it brick then? It, the St. Elmo? No, the uh, street. Yeah, it was, it was cobbles. It was yellow uh, cobblestone okay. bricks, yeah. That was, it stayed that way until well into the 1960s before they blacked out the road. Mike might know what year they did that. <laughs> really, I mean, it's, it was brick for a long time. I was working for the village. Yeah, it was one of the last streets that were still was still brick. But the, I included this again just to show the relationship of the St. Elmo to the to the train station. That's actually the second train station on the site. The first train station was wood and was built in 1841, and then this brick one was built in 1863. But you can see the businesses here, people walking up and down the street, kids on bikes. And then um, one of the questions I'm always asked, not always, but a number of times I've asked is how, how these hotels were situated, and I included this to kind of give you the streetscape to show you how it was. And this was the Occidental, which was built in 1851 by the Wickhams and uh, had many, many owners over the years. And uh, uh, Jeb's Variety Store started here in a little, which was a staircase actually, and then he moved over. Teeny Sawyer had his clothing store here for years. The bar was down here, and the dining room was off of the bar this way. And it went, it went uh, originally had square columns, and then it went under a, res a renovation, and the third story was raised like this. Originally had much, smaller windows and um, you know it went through a lot of ups and downs over the years when it was finally I think it finally burnt down in 83 I guess I'm not sure not that big okay. yes sir did these hotels have sewer systems was there a community sewer system uh, by 1920 yeah yeah but before yeah. that before that they had outhouses in the back yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. What's amazing is is um, when they go when the railroad came to Goshen in 1841, um, the train they brought two trains into Goshen and they had over 600 people. So you think about where all those people ate, went to the bathroom, stayed overnight if they did. It's, it's really quite amazing how. It, I think a lot of people took people into their houses, a lot of, you know, rented out rooms in their houses. And, but it's amazing how they accommodated it all before electricity and running water. Train B&B. Train B&B. And then... Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. What caused the St. Elmo fire? <coughs> I know when they built the Occidental, everyone at the time said it would never last, and it didn't go, but the St. Elmo... Um, supposedly said. it was a chimney fire. There was a restaurant in the St. Elmo, and um, one of the... Um, waitresses discovered the fire. And the only thing that saved the Occidental in these two buildings was the fact that the, that the St. Elmo was brick, and the, they were able to stop the fire at the brick wall. You can see that the brick went all the way up. See, this is all this, this is the end of the St. Elmo. And then these two stores um, survived, and the Occidental survived. Yes, sir? Yeah, the, the Occidental burnt, the Sweden Brothers Barbershop was there when the burnt. Yeah. After they got burnt out of on Brendan Jack, yes, and yes. they came back to where their father started business on the square. Yep, they moved around a lot. <laughs> yeah, the Trickham brothers did move around. They ended up in Scotchdown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Whoops. The Occidental burned down. Um, I believe 1983. I'm not sure. What? What is this? <laughs> I must have hit something. I'm sorry. Is, is this supposed to be on the next? This 
is um, Mr. Bogardus' meat uh, market choice meats. Um, this is the St. Elmo. You can see um, the barber shop. I have photos of the inside of the barber shop. Um, and supposedly they use, I've read recently, they use this balcony for making like political speeches and dignitaries would go up there and stand there on the balcony. And this was the, the Erie Station. Um, I could not find a single thing on Mr. Bogardus being in Goshen. I went up, I've been up to the Middletown uh, Historical Society a few times and I talked to a woman up there and she said that there was a Bogardus grocery store in Middletown. So maybe he drove this car all the way from Middletown to Goshen and just happened to be posing in front of the St. Elmo. But I could not find a Bogardus grocery store in Goshen. So if anybody knows anything I don't, let me know. And I think this is guy is just doing a photo op over here. <laughs> and again, he has a hat on. This says it's 1912. So, and I included this because I just think this is a riot. This is the this is the Goshen trolley that ran to Middletown from uh, up to 1924 up Grand Street and then all the way up to Midway Park and up into the city of Middletown. And it says here, the Goshen Traction uh, Company, I think they're on the side, it says. And this kid laying here on the cow catcher in front, and everybody kind of leaning out, looking at him. What's really, what's really strange is it's all men on the, on the uh, trolley. I don't, they must have been, I, I, don't, I really don't know what, what they were doing, but it's, I think it's highly unusual that it was just all men on the trolley. Now, this is more what um, downtown Goshen looked like um, back in the 1800s. Um, this is Vale and Armstrong. They were, he was a grocer. Um, this was a, there was a dentist that lived up, uh, uh, had a business upstairs here. This was the, uh, the Dayton building that I showed you earlier. It, had a, it was Victorianized with a round top. If you go by there, you can still see these three little windows. And uh, this is the only structure I believe that's still there. But these are all gone. These were all replaced by a, a brick building. I'm not, I think this was the brick building. The brick building was here. And then for, for underground railroad enthusiasts, this was supposed to be a site of the underground railroad in Goshen, um, simply because of its location uh, related to the Erie Station. And people would come in, they would stay here, and then they would get shuttled across to the train when the train came in and got them out of town real quick. Um, but this is probably more what Lawyer's Row actually looked like than what we know today. Um, there were wooden structures that, uh, you know, hand-built. Um, and then the downtown always had these, these um, porch things that people could walk up under to keep out of the weather. This is where I should. I don't think I said this. This is where the um, the uh, bagel place is now, which became Goshen Hardware, and the brick building that's there today. This is this is that. There's a vacant lot downtown. If anybody was wondering what was there, this was it. This was um, this is this is um, the Dayton building that I just showed you in the previous picture. There's the little windows. As the arch. This was uh, the tavern, and this was a butcher shop. Barnes's butcher was in there. Um, was it the butcher before them? And it was, I think there was a fire in there, and that building was also demolished. This is Harry Scott's grocery store. This is on West Main Street. This is now uh, Linda Maybe's office okay. supply. Okay. This is Joe Fixit's here. Um, I'm not sure if that's Harry Scott or not, but I would assume he's got the apron on. Uh, 
and the other guys are just doing photo ops. And this is his delivery wagon, which every grocery store seemed to have. And this is the inside of Harry's. This is uh, Linda's, which doesn't look anything like this today. And, uh, there's a there's an ad for Postum up here, and Sunshine Biscuits, I think we're still familiar with. And what they, so what they would do is, um, he would run around the store and get whatever the customer wanted. He'd walk in there and just grab things. You see the old pop belly stove in the back? Mm -hmm. And this is the Goshen Tea Store. I'm not sure the exact dates of this. Um, but this is the Goshen Hardware here, and this is this was Linda's, and this is the uh, ice cream store, which was uh, Ackley's, which became uh, Lobdell's. And this is John Sweezy, and John Sweezy was um, Mary Gray Griffith's grandfather, and um, he was supervisor at Goshen from 1920 to 1923. This photo was taken in 1910. So uh, in 1910, it was a Goshen tea shop. How long it lasted, I don't really know. Uh, he was mayor from president of the village from 1919 to 1921, and again from 19 uh, from 1920 to 24, he was chairman of the Orange County Board of Supervisors, and um, his Marshall Sweezy was his son, and Mary Gray was uh, his granddaughter. And again, this was, uh, they obviously had big snowstorms back in the uh, <laughs> late 1800s and early 1900s. No, the Grand Union was further up the street. We'll get there. We'll get there, John. <laughs> and then, uh, this is the inside of um, Lobdell's. Um, this is uh, Ackley's ice cream. It was Ackley's here, actually, later Lobdell's. This is George, um, George Ackley right here. And this is Catherine Hill, who uh, later married Harold Sitzer Sr. And this is Mabel Howard, who later married Leon Downs. And um, I'm not sure the exact date of the photo, um, but the story, interesting story here is, is that George Ackley and his wife Sally became friends with Anna Dickinson, who oh. was a uh, Civil War uh, speaker and um, woman's advocate, I guess, of her day. And um, the Ackleys um, originally started in, um, yeah, I don't know if you remember the build up, it's coming up in a picture um, where Bob's Sports Shop was on the square. They started out there with an ice cream parlor, closed that. Then um, they went to work uh, at the Interpines with Dr. Seward, which is where they met Anna Dickinson. And um, Sally uh, Ackley sort of developed a very close relationship with Anna Dickinson. And the Ackleys left Goshen and moved to Manhattan and opened a bakery for a short time, then came back and opened this ice cream parlor on West Main Street. And Anna Dickinson is buried next to them in Slate Hill Cemetery, and uh, there is a historic marker at her grave, too. And this is the, um, the pantry, which was next door. You could actually go through from the ice cream, you could go through the, um, from the ice cream parlor into the pantry, which Lobdell was on, on the pantry, and then the Howell brothers took it over and moved across the street. And this photo is from 1933, and uh, the reason I know that is because I researched this James Cagney movie, <laughs> which is on this billboard. It's amazing what you, details you can get out of photographs. Um, this is one of the many clocks that was along West Main Street was an institution in front of the ice cream parlor. This is the pantry where my uh, father first walked in and asked my mother to go out on a date. <laughs> and this, this, is, uh, this is West Main Street um, in the 1920s. 
Um, you can see the clock, and then um, this is the pantry sign. This is obviously before uh, overhanging signs were zoned out. This was a shoe store on uh, the corner here. This later became Robinson Stationery Store, which we'll get to in a minute. And um, notice the notice the heading in parking along uh, that side of the street, which I have some photos of different parking configurations. This is uh, in the 1930s. Not much has changed, really, except the cars. <coughs> And then over here on the on the left, you can see this is Levinson's clothing store, um, which is where George Strong ended his career, <coughs> taking over ownership of that store. And he had a long uh, career in Goshen as a clothier. And you can see up here was the A&P and the Grand Union. We'll get to it in a minute. And there is the A&P. And this is the Grand Union. The Grand Union was in the, uh, what was the Goshen Hardware building, which is now vacant. And then this is Goshen Hardware right here, along here. And this, you can see the new bank, how the bank had changed. There's pictures of this building before this bank from the other direction, where um, the, the windows in the Baxter building are visible. And then they, the bank just built up and covered up all the windows. And I, I guess, I, I'm guessing that this photo is from 1936 because this banner across Main Street down here is advertising auto races at Good Time Park. And I know they occurred in 1936. So I'm assuming that was there. You can see uh, the, the uh, train tower is still there. The barber shop was here. Uh, Farrell's cigar place was over here. There was a bathhouse along here too, which needs further investigation. <laughs> and this is a this is a Briar's ice cream advertisement here on I think it's a garbage can. This is from the 1930s. This is the AMP with the Grand Union next door and the um, shadow of the railroad house. Again, a lot of snow in, in the early uh, part of this century. And then this is um, this is the interior of the A and P, which later became Baxter's. Um, the ceiling looks awful low in this picture. I, I was looking at it the other day, and I was wondering if that was a drop ceiling or what. But I might be mistaken. Um, this is Leslie Purcell on the left, and uh, Greg Williamson on the right. And again, they, they went around and got everything the customers wanted. You didn't go in and take anything off the shelves on your own. And then the Grand Union later moved up to West Main Street, which is now, I think it's GNT Auto Parts. And uh, I included this because I do get asked this. This, this was the, sign, the frame that held the, the Grand Union sign. It's still standing. And people always say, what is that thing? And that's, that's what it looked like. And this is Sarutsky's in the background. <laughs> and this is, um, this is James and Joseph Markovitz's uh, grocery store. This is on the left-hand side. If you're facing the old Howells across the street, on uh, the same side of the street, uh, this was the, the um, dining room portion of um, what was, what was Howell's. It's now a, an empty Mexican restaurant. Um, and they, this was basically your first chain grocery store because the market business were from Middletown. And they also had a store in Middletown. Am I running out of time? Okay, that's it. A little bit more. But a little bit more. Um, and this is, um, this is Wyant's grocery store. This was a grocery store for over 100 years. Before this, it was the Reeves, and then Reeves and Kelsey, um, and then Wyant's took it over. Um, Phil, um, Philip Samuels, who owned the clothing store down, started out here um, and opened his business in, 
1865, it was here for nine years, and then moved down the street, then it became a grocery store. And then Jimmy Anderson bought it and became the lumber yard. These two buildings are no longer there. Kennett's is down here now. And this is an advertisement for Wyant's. And the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 um, the joke here is that it says no stairs, spelled S-T-A-R-E-S, -E and she's getting into the upper berth. This was a pad. A notepad. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And then this is an advertisement for um, Farrell's Jewelry Store. This is where um, Howells is now, the Sunflower Cafe, I believe. This is on the square. Um, this this store went by this site went through many different businesses. Barbershop was it was the last of it. It's a barbershop. And this is Mr. Farrell. There were six Farrell brothers and five Farrell sisters in Goshen. Um, and you can see the plate glass window, which is what I was going to talk about. This is um, what it looked like when it was Robinson's, and later you can see that it was a barber shop. And then Ezra Mills came in in the 60s, and I don't know, some, I'm sure some of you remember Ezra Mills. He wound up working for the American Wing at the Metropolitan Museum, Museum of Art, and he redid the front to the configuration we see today. He took out the big plate glass windows. And then this is um, a store with, this is, shows the trophies for, um, for the, uh, during race week in the windows of Robinson's. And Robinson's later was owned by Mrs. Gleasy. And there's a picture of Mrs. Gleasy and our good friend Joe Donovan. And this was from 1964 from the Goshen Bicentennial. And he's showing off the wooden nickels that you could use to actually buy things in the village. Uh, during the bicentennial, that's Mrs. Gleasy showing, showing holding a dollar bill, and uh, Joe Donovan owning a uh, holding up a wooden nickel. <laughs> Mrs. Gleasy lived on, on uh, Main Street, where the government center is now, and Joe's still around. Great guy. Um, and then this is a map. I'll try and finish up really quickly here. This is a map. Um, Showing, I, I include this, this shows the, both the drug stores, and this is the plumbing supply place. I mentioned the Tuthill plumbing supplies. Here's the Union Hotel. There's a number of hotels right in this area. The Commercial Hotel, uh, which is, uh, there was a fire recently where it's, um, I guess it's before the planning board to become a, an apartment building. The International Hotel building is gone. Uh, the Oriental Hotel was um, where the Wonder Bar was. And then these are all the businesses along Main Street, you can see. And then what I was talking about before, this is the park. Um, and as you can see, it was all residential. Um, this, is, this was taken, this was drawn after 1912 when the Goshen Inn was built. But this house is gone, all these houses are gone, this is gone. Uh, this is McEwen's house, Donovan's funeral parlor, and then a house next door. And then from here, all the way down here, all this is gone. All this is gone. The only thing that's left, uh, this was Finance Hotel here on Greenwich. These are all gone. This is the Farmer's Hotel. This is where Sunoco Station is. Mm -hmm. It's been changed. This was the trunk line to uh, Montgomery off of the Erie. An interesting thing. This indicates there was a park at the site of the St. Elmo. Um, I, have, I have never read anything about a park being there, but um, it could have been artistic license by the uh, artist. These are all, all these houses are gone. This is a parking lot now behind uh, the stores along West Main Street. This is an aerial view again. I won't, I'll just skim over this really quickly. This, is, this was the Fair Lumber Yard. Uh, this is, the, this is what, uh, where the Minnesink Firehouse is today. Um, you can see this is the, uh, the jail behind the courthouse. All this was gone. This was the Goshen Theater. All this square is gone. This was the Goshen Buick Building. This is, um, this is a panorama of the square showing houses along the square. 
This was the Doremus uh, Jack McShane's grocery store here on the end. This shows the, and it's one of the great things about Goshen photos, you can date them. This is the 1886 band, second bandstand in the park. See the old benches? Um, and then this is looking up West Main Street. And um, this is Main Street when it was a dirt road. And you can date this. This is the Wisner Monument in the background, which was 1897. So this photo is definitely somewhere after 1897. I think I found this photo at a yard sale, which was really amazing. And then this shows, this is the 1851 County Clerk's Office, which later became uh, the county building that's on the square. This is how it started out. And if you go by there and look, this face, this front faced the um, Orange Blossoms Monument that's there. Um, and again, guys, just taking photo ops here. Let me know when you want me to stop, because I can just keep going. <laughs> OK, two more minutes. OK. Yeah, this is, uh, this is West Main Street. This is one of those photos where you can see the horse and buggy and the automobile. This was um, Hinchman's Grocery Store, which later became Sealy's and then um, Dayton's and then um, Julia Maney's Dry Goods Store. This is Rutan's uh, Meat Market, which later became Fred Glass's. And again, the walkability of the village. I mean, just look at the foot traffic. This is an ad for Fred Glass. Uh, more for your money. See, a lot of, like I was talking before, on the square in Goshen. They don't give you a number. They just say it's on the square. And then this is, um, later became Jim's Meat Market. And this was Bob Reisinger's Sporting Goods Store, which was many businesses. This is where Mr. Ackley started out with his ice cream pot. But originally, I was I had read and discussed with people. This was John Doerr's law office, which was on the site of Maplewood, the Village Hall. And John Doerr sold the property where the Village Hall is and had this building moved down Main Street to here. So it, it goes pretty, it goes back to the early 1800s. And this is the inside of, um, of Fred Glass's meat market. And um, one of these guys, and I'm not sure how this was, um, how this, if it identifies them. One is um, a McNeese, and one is, I forget the other guy's name, I don't know. And a Ryerson, and I'm not sure which one's which, but I remember, I don't know if anybody remembers, this was the refrigerator in the back, there's the door. It looked just like this one, Mr. Glass, Mr. and Mrs. Glass ran it. And then uh, here's a picture again. This is um, when it was Hinchman's Grocery, uh, I believe, or Seeley's Grocery Store. And there's the horse and buggy. Good, good shot of North Church Street. And here's Rutan's uh, delivery wagon. You could probably. This is the second. Actually, the corner here is. This is the second horse trough, um, which was replaced by the Harriman Fountain that's there today. <coughs> And just a panorama of the village, uh, same scene. This is uh, looking up West Main Street when uh, the Harriman Fountain became a planter. <coughs> this I included just to show you the different parking configurations and how we could never do this today. <laughs> this is the base of the flagpole in front of Maplewood. Anybody? Overhanging signs. This is Greenwich Avenue. All this on the left is gone. This is one Harriman Square, which is still standing. This was um, an auto supply uh, place.
Does anybody have any questions? Were you going to talk about the future of um, the person with the The future? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I'm a historian. We don't really talk about that. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry. You were talking to him before. How did that little grocery store get the nickname of the lemon? They probably sold lemons. Uh, uh, there's, there, uh, there's a story, if I can just, uh, let's see, where are we here? Let me go just a little bit more, because uh, you could, there's some good stuff. Uh, actually, this, you can see here, this is an advertise, whoops. This is an advertisement up here for a billiards parlor, which was in that building. That's a billiards up there. Um, and this is Rick, Rick Bourne's grocery store on Greenwich. And this is Jack McShane's, which was along Greenwich. This is Jack McShane here. And then the CLE, this next door, which later became a bakery. Frazier's Bakery, this is Jack McShane's. And there's Jack McShane's uh, next door. He had moved, you can see in the back, you can see in the reflection here, um, the arch windows from one Harriman square there. It's uh, a law office now. And Jack McShane lived, I, I knew Jack McShane, so he was around in the 60s. And here's what the block looked like. This was the first Jack McShane store, and then he moved over here. This was Dylan Beck's auto supply company here. You can see the independent Republican building here on the right, which was a brick building, which also had a grocery store early on. And then this was Clara's, which was, um, was a great after school spot for the kids. And this is Arvonite's liquor store. Oops, sorry. This is the Independent Republican Building. Um, and all this was, that you're seeing was demolished for the Goshen Savings Bank, which is on the site today. And then this is looking further up the street <coughs> where the railroad came through. This was the Goshen, Goshen Buick Building. This building is still there, the railroad house, which was a bar and a hotel. And then this was, not a great photo, but it gives you the idea. This was the end of Market Street. This was Fetch. Fetch is over here now. And this was uh, Jim Ballard's grocery store. And um, to go back to your question about the lemon, I was told that Mr. Ballard was uh, one of the first grocery stores to have bananas. So people would go downtown and go to his grocery store to see what a banana looked like. <laughs> and he also had a delivery truck, and I've talked to people who uh, remember having groceries delivered by him. And this, this later, this was originally a private house, and then it evolved into a business, and this was, it was Orange County Printing, I believe, and then Ed Rabideau, who owned Goshen Buick, tore this down, and it was a, part, a very small parking lot for a number of years, and then the, there's a house on there now, which I believe is a grocery store if it's still there. And then this is a view of the square. Um, this was uh, Dylan Beck's auto supply here on the corner. This was Jack McShane's, the uh, Doremus building. You can see uh, North Church Street was um, concrete. And this is, in 1961, the beginning of the demolition of the, the uh, corner. Oops, I'm losing my... And this is Nash's, which I believe was in um, the Independent Republican building, which I just showed you. And then this, I wanted to show you. This is Annie Gilbaki's grocery store. And this was, our, this was a Goshen institution. Annie ran this place by herself, I believe, for quite a few years. Um, and she... Um, there's a picture of Anne Gilbaki, and she was always there. She was open seven days a week, and um, oops, sorry. And this is the Doremus Horton, Horton, and then it became Doremus's, and then McShane's on the square. This was a your traditional grocery store with a potbelly stove, and the horse and buggy out front. This is a picture of. Uh, 
when it was Doremus's with the, the 1911 heroin fountain, and then the demolition of the buildings. When was that, Ed? 1961. These were demo these were like townhouses. Um, and they, they were really um, sort of gutted before they were torn down because they had uh, beautiful mantles that were taken out. Again, this was like, originally, like I said, the, the park was a residential area. Was that and by the movie house? Yes, the movie house was further up the street. The movie house was down here this way. And then, we'll just do these last few. Um, this is the Old Chester Road. Now before 17 and the Crickway came through, this is how people came to the Catskills of Old Chester Road. And Old Chester Road came right down into the square of Goshen. So you can imagine how that was a, 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 a great thing for business owners downtown. And then, whoops, sorry. This is um, Old Chester Road. This is yes. Slade Hill Cemetery on the left. And this is the this is uh, Lawrence Bur Judge Lawrence Burnett's farm, Hillside. Um, it's on Old Chester Road. There's a stone house there now. It was a Westinghouse. Uh, Hamiltonian Spa is across the street here. And he died in 1915. But what's is interesting is the barn burnt in 19 uh, like 14. Then the house burnt, and then he died. So he's buried in Slade Hill Cemetery too. And then this is the building of the Quickway. This is it from a newspaper photo, but it gives you an idea of uh, what, what this swath of land uh, was subjected to. This is, the, um, this is what became the Quickway Route 17. This is the Florida Road. This is um, West Main Street up here. The ice cream store is there. This is CVS Plaza. This was the Matthews Farm. Um, and I don't have a picture of that house, but I do remember it as a kid, if anybody ever comes across that. This is um, the completion of it. This is how the area got the nickname, the Cloverleaf, because this is the way the exits were designed. This is the gas station that's still there. Whoops. Sorry. And then this is Matthew Street. This is where the CVS Plaza is. Um, well, the Crookway came in in the late 40s, early 50s. I'm not sure when that, these particular photos were taken. This is um, 17, the Crookway showing, probably taken from the South Street overpass, showing the Yonkers Raceway signs, which at the time owned Good Time Park, which was right here, which was the mile racetrack. And the Florida Road is, this is, um, this is the Welcome to Goshen sign that was on the corner. The diner is over here on this part of the street. And then, there's a skate in the upper left. The skate. Sorry. And then this is um, looking west. You can see the outline of the uh, mile track, the stables. Here's historic track. And then this is, all this is Lego land. This is the res there's a reservoir, the Green Hill Reservoir right there. And this was probably taken, I don't know, uh, I didn't really didn't look that closely at this. Hilltop Drive is there, so this is probably um, 60s maybe. And then this is the Eureka Steakhouse, which was on the site of Legoland, which was a, it was a farm, the Dunning Farm originally. And then it had many owners, and then um, John LaBerton, a partner, owned, opened a restaurant, the Eureka Steakhouse there. And then over the years, it became Hillcrest Manor, and um, a disco, and finally burnt down and was demolished. And then I included this, just to show, even back in the uh, 30s, Goshen was a vacation destination, and uh, Ivory's milk delivery uh, wagon on the square, Sorry to be going so fast here. Um, and then this is John Milburn's milk truck. 
people remember John. And uh, if, if somebody asked me about the phone, it was AX4, Axe Minister 4. If anybody, good trivia question. And then these are um, some Goshen ladies. Um, this is my mom. That's Val. This is uh, Sue Hammer. Jerry. Yeah. Sue Valley. This is Jane Clayton. This is Margie um, Fabrica Carroll. And this is Jerry Valley Schwartz. And they, she told, I talked to Jerry recently, and she said this was, uh, I believe this was 1942, and they went to New York to see a play, and they got back to Goshen at the unheard of hour of 2 a.m. And Bob Bruce, who was the chief of police, met him at the train station and gave him all a ride home. <laughs> so, and then, this is a scene you won't see anymore. This is Houston Road, yep. and um, I believe this is a Mr. McEwen herding the cows up to the Houston farm. And this is the Florida Road in the background. And that's it. Any more uh, questions? Yes, sir. about the building at the end of Greenwich Avenue and the square when you call the Ocean Savings Bank. Because I still say that myself. My kids go, what are you talking about? Yeah, that you? happens. That's like you go up to play toms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Or, or, or Bradley's Corner. Right? Yeah. Um, but the question then that I want to ask you was, the, you've done a great job of accumulating all of these individual pictures from lots of sources and have them organized, and, and it's just terrific. Is anybody doing anything, photographing things in Goshen today? Is that a I do all the time. Do you? Oh, yeah. All the time. Like when the man who was renovating the Smith house there, I photographed the guy scraping it, taking the roof off. OK. But I mean, I just think that. Not a, what, what, what I think should be required is that when a demolition permit is issued by the building inspector, that part of the process is that the buildings be photographed before they're torn down. Mm -hmm. And that, that, there was a lot of buildings that there's just no photos of at all. Yeah. Especially houses, it's amazing. Well, it's amazing how, how few photographs there are of the houses. When you're giving this talk 50 years from now, you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, somebody, I, hopefully somebody will still be interested 50 years from now. Yes. And why do you think that there were so many uh, pharmacies in Goshen? It seems like an awful lot of pharmacies. <laughs> was it a health center or? Was there um, a well, the the where where um, Decker's was and then later became Strong's. He had the they had the hospital up there in the, the you know the early 1900s. Um, People didn't, you know, people didn't commute to go to the city for uh, employment. So a lot of these people, you know, he went from being a harness maker, one guy, to being a pharmacist. I mean, you sort of adapted to what was around, and uh, you know, people moved. Part of the, the hard part of this thing is people moved around a lot. You know, when, you know they they started out working for somebody else. They went up the street, opened their own store, and opened, and moved, and Rick Rickborn. Was, I quickly showed you on the square, he was there, and then he moved further up Greenwich Avenue and was there for like another 25 years in a grocery store. So, I don't know if I answered your question. But yes? I remember in Strong's, they had veterinary supplies, so it was pharmaceuticals for the people, but it was also recognizing the residents at the Trotting on the street, and they needed liniments and stuff for the horses. That kind of added to the scope of the Yes, Dave. I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Part of the question of why there were so many pharmacists, pharmacists are more of a practitioner in that era. Each yeah. pharmacist had its own hospitals and own, it's not as uh, standardized as it is right. now. You get the same thing in CVS as you get in the right age. Like, I think, I think when Dr. Ar Arnell was in 1820, was a pharmacist, him being a doctor was really unusual. Yeah. 
most most pharmacists. Well, they used to compound their own medicine. Yeah, right. Yeah. Which is John just implied. Yeah. Yes, John. You mentioned a pharmacist called Arthur Decker. Uh, the intersection of West the Wisner Avenue, Church, <coughs> and North Church Street. Uh, Arthur Decker lived there. He <laughs> was the secretary for the U.S. or the state senate. Any relation, same person? Or? Could be. There were a number of Arthur Deckers, which made <coughs> researching it, you know, hard. David. You mentioned a couple of places that had restaurants in the basement. Yeah. And I think you, one of them, I think you said, was what had been Baxter's Park. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it look like down there? Well, what's interesting is, in, um, I don't, I'm not so sure about the Baxter building, because that was built in the 1860s, so the railroad had already been there for 20 years. That area was a low-lying area. It was a, basically a swamp. And then you had Prospect Hill, where Prospect Avenue is. And that was basically the country. When the business district was here on Lawyers Row, that area was out of town. There was a guy, John Valentine, and in 1820, he um, excuse me, 1920, he celebrated his 100th birthday, and he was interviewed by the um, Independent Republican. And in that article, he was, he talks about the area where, um, that area where the train, the train tracks are, and how there was a house on the site where Wangers was. Um, you know, there was a house there, but they had to walk on planks, because the, the, the house was higher than the, the ground. And I've been told, like in in um, in Marker, the Marker building where the lemon was, um, if you go down in the basement there, there's there are windows in the basement. So that area was, you know, didn't look like it does. They filled it in to accommodate the railroad tracks, and uh, it, the configuration was totally different than what we know today. So do you, are you saying that maybe that was? It, it could be. Yes, it could have had now. windows. Yeah. Because that whole area was raised. Sure. Anybody? Anybody else want to? If not, um, I'm going to be around, so you can just come on up and talk. And thank you all thank for coming. You. Sorry, we had to kind of cut things. We've got another group coming in after us, and we've got to get this whole place cleared out. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody. I'm going to